For those of you who have seen uh, Mike Wayne give a talk, you know he's an excellent speaker with excellent slides. And to be honest, when I was in the audience, I used to be, uh, feel bad for the guy who had to follow him. And now, unfortunately, I'm that guy. So um, hopefully this talk will still be uh, just as good and informative. So what I'll be talking with you about today is the Mazor X Stealth Edition, Global Alignment Planning to Execution in the OR. Uh, in terms of the overview, again, just as my title says, we'll go over pre-op planning, execution in the OR, and then we'll conclude. Now, when it comes to pre-op planning, as all of you know, spine surgery requires, especially the complex procedures, bony fixation. And the analogy I make for bony fixation is like laying down the rebar, pouring down cement, forming the foundation. But that's not the surgery, right? The surgery is building the building. Your grafts, your osteotomies, rotting tumor resection, your deformity correction, that is the actual surgery. But in preparation for that, in putting down your bony fixation, there are a lot of options right now in terms of those methods. For the purposes of this talk, I'll group together navigation, fluorocyst, and freehand technique under what I call intra-op doing. Now, where navigated spinal robotics comes into play is here, and I will group that under something called pre-op planning, which is the title of this section. Now, in terms of intra-op doing, we all are very familiar with these techniques, and for all of you who have done uh, these methods, essentially you show up in the OR and you just do. You spin the O-arm, you uh, get your C-arm ready, you expose your anatomy, and then you just do in real time. Troubleshoot in real time, check in real time. So everything is done in the moment in the operating room. Now this is fine if the anatomy is very straightforward or there's no complications with the patient, but when you, when you encounter anatomy like this that is difficult, this is when you start to reach the borders of either your own comfort zone or the ability to deliver good patient care. Also, when you start to encounter body habituses that actually um, are impediments to the technology, right? With large um, body habituses that actually may push against your navigation instruments or are just very difficult for the C-arm to penetrate, this becomes challenging for these types of methods. Now, you realize then you spend all this time just putting in the pedicle screws, just putting in the bony fixation, and you haven't even gotten to the actual purpose of the surgery. Now, the disadvantages of these um, techniques are well known, um, so I won't uh, go too much into this, but one of the things that bridge them in common is this on-the-fly troubleshooting. If something isn't right in terms of your bony fixation, bring in the O-arm, bring in the C-arm, let's take another shot, let's do a laminotomy and feel the medial pedicle, is there a breach or not? And so, the purpose of this talk, then, hopefully is for me to help you see the benefits and navigated spinal robotics, and through that, an understanding of pre-op planning. Now, this is a workflow shift, and as I've very um, been, uh, I've said very commonly, old ways won't open new doors, and so instead of the old ways of intra-op doing, nav, fluoro, and freehand, let's open new doors with pre-op planning in utilizing navigated spinal robotics. Planning allows you to execute your plan within two millimeters of accuracy. And the thing is, is when you plan, just like in any type of surgery you do, we always have an image of what we want to do and execute in the operating room. The actual execution of that can be variable, depending on our experience or the experience of our assist or the technologies we have available. Pre-op planning makes it so that you don't have to keep it in your mind anymore. The software keeps it for you and then assists and allows you to execute that plan. This is pre-op planning. So we're moving away from just showing up in the operating room and doing, but we're actually thinking about and putting down that plan before your patient or you even get to the operating room. This is the workflow comparison with intra-op doing, nav fluoro, freehand assist. As all of you know, you review the x-ray, you review the MRI, you show up in the OR, and then you just do. You bring in your C-arm, you bring in your O-arm, you navigate your instruments, and then you troubleshoot as needed, you fix something as needed. If there's something confusing, then you, you do all your problems as they come up in real time. Now with pre-op planning, there is an upfront investment in time in developing the plan. But once you develop the plan, all you have to do is show up in the OR, the tech set up the robotic system, and then you place your implants, and then you move on with your life. And the reason why I set it up in this way is there is a potential here in this savings of the most valuable time there is 
which is OR time. OR time uh, in terms of the hospital, your OR time, the patient under anesthesia in the OR. And this is because with pre-op planning, you've already decided all of your things, your entry points, trajectories, the screw diameter, the length. Because it is your patient's CT, you've already looked at all of the potential anomalies of your patient's anatomy, such as large facet, small pedicle, scoliotic curves, revision, fusion mass, uncommon trajectories. All of these have already been determined by you so that when you get to the OR, there's an accurate placement of the implants based off of your surgical goal. Now, the analogy that I really like to make is that of bowling. With intraop doing, nav floor or freehand assist, you roll the ball down the lane, and usually, you know, you get it down the pins. Every once in a while, there's some troubleshooting. Again, bring in the C-arm, bring in the, flo uh, the floor machine, bring in the arm. Pre-op planning allows you to set down lanes so that each time you roll that ball, you have a precise, accurate, and reproducible ability to put down the implants where you want to put them. All of you now have seen um, the robotic arm in action. So again, from a start position, the arm is sent to the first target. It becomes rigid and fixed. Drill, tap, screw, lay down the screw, determine your next target, send the arm to the next target, becomes rigid again, drill, tap, screw, lay down your screw, and then you move on. And you can see now how with this workflow, the purposes of bony fixation become such a small part of your surgery because now you can focus on the real um, goals of the surgery, which again are your grafts, osteotomies, tumor resection, deformity correction. And this is really where the patients get the good outcome. Now the million dollar question of course becomes how long does pre-op planning take? And this is a brief example of an L45 MIST lift for those of you who are familiar with this software, again, the, the patient's CT scan is loaded up. You determine the region of interest, and the software auto-segments this out into each vertebral body in a segmental block. And this is where the segmentation comes in. You can see here, I'm determining the exact screws that I want to use, a 6545 at the level of L4. I'm determining the entry points, the trajectories. I can scroll through the scan just like a CT scan to make sure the screws are exactly where I want it, both in the axial. Here in the sagittal um, dimension, I'm bringing down the entry point. This is an MIS application, so I want the screws to cluster together. So even here, the fine tuning, I can determine um, not in the operating room, but before the operating room. Here at the next level at L5, as many of you have placed percutaneous L5 S1 screws, I can already determine that the iliac crests won't get in the way. So here I can avoid iliac crest collision. I'm sizing a 7545. And again, more fine tuning. I can bring up the entry point, change the trajectory to cluster my incisions. I'm planning this as a minimally invasive application. And you'll be able to see now on the left-hand side of the screen the clustering of those towers and how the incisions now all make sense so that when I show up in the operating room and these are where the screws go, this is gonna be my mini open corridor on the T-lift side. Optional, I can put down my T-lift plan. So if this is where my corridor is in Camden's Triangle, I can make sure that it's actually going to travel down my mini open path so there are no surprises at all when I'm in the operating room and doing this surgery. You can see here all the screws in bone, MIS incisions are clustered, the L5 screw avoids the iliac crest, no surprises, the corridor is appropriate, everything is set as perfect as I can make it, again, to set myself up for success so that the Mozorak system can set me up for success for a good patient outcome. Now that is pre-op planning. So the next big question becomes, how is this actually realized in the operating room with the execution in the OR? Now for this first case, execution in the OR with pre-op planning, this is that case, L45 MIS T-lift. This was the plan, and this was the execution in the OR. So you can see good overlap of that plan. And in terms of the actual operating room itself, once I put down my pilot hole, this is the ATS screw, so I don't need to tap. And again, all it is is putting down that screw. As you can see, I, I do everything on continuous power. I think it's a good, uh, nice, smooth delivery of power down this type of application. Once that screw goes down, I detach the driver. I remove it. The arm, as you see here, is sent to the next position, right down that mini open corridor that I had already planned. So no issues, no surprises. I put down that next screw, and I move on with the rest of my life. 
Next, L4 to S1 MIST lift, so a two-level MIST lift. Again, you see the plan on the left and the application on the right, so good apposition of that plan. And again, in the operating room, you can see the live pink screw going perfectly coaxial down the teal plan. So unlike uh, navigation, which is live and there's no um, set, uh, I guess, direction and guidance for you with a robotic arm, here everything is perfectly coaxial to what your plan is. Say you're dealing with a larger case, T4 to pelvis. You can see here, this is planned as well, T4 all the way down to ilium. Again, it's a lot of work, especially with the prior Harrington rod. There's the rod, there's the fusion mass. You don't want putting the screws in to be the barrier for you to accomplish your surgical goals. This is already going to be a difficult case. This is what it looks like in terms of execution in the OR, but with the Mizorak system, you, hear, you can see good apposition of the plan L3 up to T10, and then T9 up to T4. And again, pre-op and post-op here, and you can see a good correction of his sagittal alignment. And again, the purpose here is to show that with a difficult case as this, you don't want just putting in the bony fixation to be that barrier, right? The case is already hard enough. So you wanna make it as easy as possible, and with these technologies available, it makes it much more straightforward. Good correction of sagittal balance, correction of pelvic tilt, the next case, T4 to pelvis revision with the quad S2 AI construct. So this patient came to me with a distal pseudoarthrosis. And you'll be able to see here haloing of the bilateral S1 screws as well as his single pelvic screw. So he came in with terrible pain, um, terrible distal pseudoarthrosis. And so what I wanted to do was get extra pelvic fixation because that's the only thing that we could do in this particular case to solve the haloing at that level. I planned here a dual S2 AI screws bilaterally, so quad S2 AI screw construct. You can see here the positioning, right? The robotic arm is out of the way. So an example of its execution in the OR, this is what it is and what it looks like. And again, for putting in S2 AI screws robotically, um, two on the same side, this is what it looks like. The arm comes in, becomes rigid and fixed. I do my drill, I do my two taps, I put down my screw, detach it, move on to the next level, and then move on with the rest of the case. This was the final construct here in terms of dual S2 AI screws bilaterally. Here you see, again, good overlap of that plan, something that was very, very straightforward. And even with other techniques such as freehand floral or NAV or single S2 AI screws, you can see now the doors that are opening with the use of navigated robotic assistance. You can see here, good overlap of that plan. And then what's really nice is all of you saw that haloing of the iliac screw with the use of this navigated technology, each iliac screw completely misses that prior tract. So each iliac screw is in good bone, which is again the purpose of this surgery, to give this patient back good fixation in the pelvis. And this is something for sure that I would have only been able to uh, be able to do with pre-op planning and robotics pre-op and post-op for this case. Now, lastly, execution the OR with uh, planning and exaline. Now, everything I've shown so far has to do with planning of the implants and the pedicle screws. What's really powerful with the Mizorak Stealth Edition is the X-Align software, which allows you now to plan your correction. It plans your graphs, it plans all of your osteotomy cuts, and I have a few cases here to show you that. So for all of you who are familiar with the summary details uh, screen of the software, down in the lower right-hand corner, there's this X-Align button. And if you were to activate this button, it allows you uh, to do what I'm about to show you. This case is an L2 to pelvis, L3 to S1 T-Lift, MIS. So here, I've already planned the screws, and the software tells me where that rod goes based off of the screws. But what I can do is tell the software that I want to put in a straight rod, right? only bent in the sagittal plane. This is called a planar rod, and you can see here the screws, uh, the software tells me that these screws that are purple are not gonna fit within the limits of the tulips. So now I can actually fine tune and bring those screws over in planning to pass a planar, only sagittally bent rod. You can see now I'm doing fine tuning of that screw so that in planning for an MIS application and passing down that rod, Again, I don't want the most difficult part of the surgery to be the bony fixation and the implants. Once I do that, I can start doing my inner body cage planning so I can input in inner body cages and the software will estimate how much lordosis I'll be able to get. 
And once I apply those, you can actually see that with that correction, one of my screws has been thrown off the path of the planar rod. So now I can correct the entry point of that screw anticipating the correction that I'm going to get after this application. Here you can see the final construct, L2 to ilium, with a three to one uh, T-lift, so posterior only case uh, in this particular case. This was what the software spit out to me in terms of where I could expect my skin incisions and my towers. And you can see here, this was what it looked like in the operating room, right? So very accurate, uh, I guess, preparation for what I was going to anticipate. You can see here, L2, L3, L4, L5, S1, S2 AI screws. Execution in the OR, the positioning of the robotic arm, again, very intuitive for what it's allowing me to accomplish. And here, this was the plan, L2 down to ilium, and this was the fluoroscopic image, right? L2 down to ilium. You can see here, with the X-Line software, good apposition of what I should expect once I do this case and do my correction. Next case, the T9 to pelvis. Again, a person who came in with terrible sagittal imbalance, I'm putting in uh, posterior column osteotomies here. So you can see here, I'm putting in and marking those wedges. Each of those wedges, I'm putting four, uh, in this particular case, down in the lumbar spine. I'm doing a conservative estimate of about eight degrees per osteotomy. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll see the PILL mismatch, which is red. As I activate these osteotomies, you can see the spine is being brought back. And you'll actually see that PILL mismatch turn green, which is essentially predicting for me that that's enough. I can derotate the spine as well. Here, again, it's a conservative derotation. I didn't believe that I would be able to completely bring her straight, which she didn't necessarily need. But again, you can see lower left-hand corner, PILL mismatch is red. And then as I correct, it turns green to tell me that I'm within my parameters. This is the construct. And again, the predicted pre-op, 5.4 degrees of lordosis. The predicted post-op, I got about 36.7 degrees of lordosis. And this was the actual execution in the OR. Okay, five degrees preoperatively, 38 degrees postoperatively of what I wanted to match for her. Good correction of pelvic tilt. You can see here the pre-op and the post-op. And again, this was the plan. And I knew that based off of this plan, when I turned on the planar rod function, there was no way that as I planned it here that I was going to get in a single rod. So I knew going into this case, it was going to be some sort of quad, wa uh, quad rod construct for the surgery. Uh, again, execution in the OR in terms of what it looks like. Um, for my last case that I wanted to show you, a T3 down to pelvis, someone who comes in with sagittal imbalance, a flexible thoracolumbar uh, kyphosis, you can see here I'm dialing in the posterior column osteotomies across the thoracolumbar junction, which is the focus of her kyphosis. Again, sort of a conservative uh, six degrees per, uh, per cut. And as I bring that back, it's correcting the spine to give me an idea of what I should expect in the surgery. It's still, um, and so you can see here the preoperative 70 degrees across that region, corrected to 18 degrees after the surgery. Now the thing is, it's still a lot of work. You still have to do all the osteotomies, all of the correction, but the software allows me to know that it's enough. When I'm just doing these osteotomies at this region, this is enough and it's appropriate. And I'll show you here, this was the predicted alignment when I put in those osteotomies and you can see good predicted apposition for what ended up being the outcome for this patient. And I do wanna share, she sent me this message over our EMR system. Uh, to me, thanks to you and your team for the first time in more than 15 years, I am pain free. I am home with PT and OT working with me. I will be standing before Christmas and maybe walking a few steps by the New Year's. The best to you and yours. Again, a great patient outcome with the assistance um, with the technology that we have available. So. In conclusion, I do wanna say again, old ways won't open these new doors. So instead of just the old ways of just NAB, just fluoro, just freehand assist, I'm sorry, freehand technique, let's open these new doors utilizing preoperative planning, utilizing navigated spinal robotics. You know, I used this slide earlier to sort of give the general structure of this talk as in me helping you. Um, you know, be convinced or come around to the idea of navigated spinal robotics with pre-op planning. But really, the more accurate slide is this. And it's essentially the Mazor X Stealth Edition with navigated spinal robotics helping all of us get all of the best patient outcomes that we want.
And that's it, uh, regulatory slides, and um, thank you.